So good morning or good afternoon or good evening to all of you watching the Global Immunotalks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Kate Fitzgerald. I'm at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School in just outside the Boston area in the US. And I'm joined today by Professor Paul Herzog from uh, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And it's evening time for Hi, Kate. Paul. It's it's early morning here. Welcome, Paul. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Kate. Looking forward to this. Yeah, this will be great. So before, yeah. before we get into today's talk and before I introduce you, I just want to remind everyone our next speaker next week is Sonia Tugas. Um, and tune in for that. That will be next Wednesday at noon uh, Eastern time. All right, so I'll, I'll get started. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Paul. I've known Paul for a long time, actually, since I was a student uh, mm -hmm. over 20 years ago now. Um, Paul is head of the regulation of interferon and an eight signaling lab in the Center for Innate Immunity and Infectious Disease, and that's at the Hudson Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne, Australia. Um, he's also a professor in the Department of Molecular and Translational Sciences at Monash University. And Paul did his PhD at the University of Melbourne uh, in biochemistry and pathology. And then he went to the US and the UK for postdocs, um, I believe at uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And then he was also at the University of New York uh, the University of York in York, England. Correct. Uh, yeah. And in those cases, he was more focused on cancer, actually chemical carcinogenesis in the liver. And then he worked on bladder and breast cancer um, at Omaha, Nebraska. And then Paul went back to Australia and he's really had a, a stellar career focused on immune responses to infection, inflammation, and, and also cancer, which has sort of been a a thread throughout his career. Uh, during his many years in innate immunity research, he's really sort of developed an interdisciplinary program that uses structural biology, sort of signal transduction and gene expression, um, as well as models of, of disease and um, also some clinical studies. So he's really sort of spans the spectrum. And Paul has a number of really notable discoveries in the field of interferon. So he cloned the murine IFNAR2 receptor. He was also uh, generated uh, the IFNAR1 knockout mouse line, which uh, I know I use personally in my own research. He characterized SOX1 as a critical negative regulator of interferon. Um, he's also developed the interferome database and, and many other discoveries, including most recently some really beautiful work on the role of interferon epsilon. This is a unique epithelial interferon that seems to protect the mucosa from both infection and cancer. Paul has over 250 peer-reviewed papers in the highest of journals, and he's got many uh, awards and recognitions over the years, but I'll highlight in particular the Milstein Award for Excellence in Cytokine Research, and this is really the sort of pinnacle of uh, research awards by the International Cytokine and Interferon Society. Um, Paul has been very active in the field, organizes a lot of conferences um, in Australia and, and around the world, and um, it's always a pleasure to hear hear about his work. So, Paul, before you Thanks, guys. before you talk, one thing we do on these global uh, immunotalks is because we have an audience from across the world, trainees in probably almost all countries across the world. We always like to sort of talk a little bit about careers and career advice and how you got to where you got. So, I wanted to ask you, you know, looking back at your career. Sort of what advice would you give to your 25 year old self if you were, you know, back reverse time and sort of tell yourself some advice? Can't remember that far back, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably two ways to answer that, didn't it? If, if, it were, if it was when I was 25, I mean, what would I do differently at that time? I think I'd probably want to be more confident, probably collaborate more, which I think um, perhaps was a bit slow to learn and also get into a structured environment. I, I think if I was, that'd be, it'd be quite different if I was 25 now, I think, and I was advising a 25 year old, you know, I think it'd be more to 
go to a good place. I mean, I, I think um, that's that's really important. There are plenty of them around. Yeah. And um, I, I really like bioinformatics and big data handling, and I think um, it's something I wish I could I, I could do. So I think I'd I'd probably advise myself to do bioinformatics as well as the biology that I like. Yeah. I think handling yeah. the big data is uh, there's so much information and excitement in there. That would be great. Yeah, no, that's really, I think that's really good advice. I think for all trainees these days, learning to code and be able to kind of really analyze your own data, I think you can get more out of it than, you know, through yeah. applications. Yeah, good advice. All oh, right, yeah. well, without, without further ado, um, we're really happy to have you as a speaker. You're going to talk about the politics of interferons and their receptors dividing up the defense portfolios in the mucosa. So it sounds very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, Kate? I'll have a go at sharing screen. Yeah, you share your screen, and then I'm going to stop my video, and the stage will be yours. Screen two. At the, uh, hang on, go back. not um sorry i'm having trouble with the uh changes here let me uh i'm gonna make you a co-host just are you able to share do you have i thought so can we pause for a minute or something um yeah hang on one sec i'm gonna pause. thanks kate for the generous introduction uh it's a, it's a real honour and thanks to the organising. It's a great, I've been listening to some of these global immuno talks. And I think it's a great initiative and I'm really honoured to be here. Um, as is uh, traditional in Australia, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners and custodians of the land that I'm working on uh, and acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, waters and community and pay respect to their, to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'll be talking today, as uh, Kate intimated, on the interferons. The three main types are summarised here, type 1, 2 and 3. They, they, they're, they're grouped in, according to their, their protein ligands. Uh, they're defined very much by the, the receptors they, they bind with. The, the ligands are induced quite differently. I think uh, type 1 and 3 interferons are often produced by induced by PAMPs in response to uh, infections or something that simulates an infection, whereas type 2 interferon gamma is really pretty different. It's uh, induced by cytokines like IL-12, produced by uh, T cells and NK cells and quite a different kettle of fish. So I'll probably focus on mainly on type 1 interferons, but inferring a lot about the type 3, which is starting to interest me more because they're produced at the same time um, they're often thought they're the lambda receptors because their receptors have TIC2 and JAK1 on them like the type 1 receptors activate this ISGF3. And the gene sets that they induce are, are, seem to be a subset of the type 1s, although I'm sure we'll find with more work something that segregates them. Um, so this plethora of type 1 interferons is archetypal. It's really unusual that you have about 17 different ligands at all hone in on this one receptor system that seems to be redundant. And then you can activate all these different JAK pathways and non-JAK pathways um, to um, activate a set of genes in our interferome collection that Kate mentioned. We have over 4,000 potential ISGs now, or IRGs, genes that can be regulated up and down by interferons. And, and they encode the effect of proteins that are responsible for all these different wonderful biological effects that they can carry out. And really sort of they sort of titrate this balance between maintaining homeostasis or developing disease. And the question really remains is, you know, why is this system co so complex? Why do we need these multi-gene families to achieve uh, the protection that, that it affords? And, you know, at, at a simple level, it really breaks down, I think, into two parts. One is regulation of their differential expression. And what you see is a picture of uh, pr the promoters of the type 1 interferons uh, 
uh, the, 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 the transcription factor binding sites that regulating, you can see the diversity there that's responding to making sure we can respond, produce one of these factors in response to a broad range of stimuli. And the other side, side of the coin is that the, um, the signaling mediated by this receptor and, and basically how that's regulated. And uh, the talk today is gonna to be separated into, into two parts really. Um, I'll, I'll talk first about the receptors and perhaps what their roles are <clears throat> In, in, in sorting out the different activities that are needed, say at a mucosal site of infection, and then talk about the ligands or some of the particular ones that I'm interested in. Um, so the, the way receptors can regulate responses are varied and, and what we see in the interferons is that they, they have different affinities of binding. And we know from this and other systems that high and low binding affinity to, can have really diverse biological outcomes in, in sort of uh, T cells and B cells, it can be the difference between activation or energy, sort of activation and death, really. There are different forms, transmembrane and soluble, which have different effects. Uh, you can have ligands binding differentially to one or other receptor systems, sometimes cross-talk with receptors from other systems, so pull them in to bring in other, other functions. And also different cells, because of their different natures and makeup, can have different molecules attached to the in, inside of these receptors and therefore transduce different signals. In the table there, you can see the, the, the range of uh, binding affinities. These are nanomolars of alpha-2, beta being quite high affinity with IFNA2, which is usually the high affinity uh, binding component, and IFNA1 also diverse but much lower affinity, except for the case of epsilon, which is pretty low affinity to both, and I'll, I'll discuss that quite a bit later. Um, so with regard to the, the different types of signaling you can get, we showed some time ago, this is a summary of the news and views of our article we published describing non-canonical signaling, whereby at least in the mouse system, interferon beta could bind just to if now one and transduce a signal that was different to the conventional stat signals you get binding to two receptor components. Beta could do it, alpha couldn't because it bound with higher affinity, we, we showed by the X-ray crystal structure. Uh, and so from the structure, we, we made sense of the interaction surfaces, why beta and not alpha could do it. Um, we actually showed by looking at IFNA2 knockout cells, which only had the IFNA1 there, that while there are a lot of a, a normal response that you couldn't induce, this circle here represents genes induced in the IFNA2 knockout mice through this non-canonical signaling there's a component that you see normally, a component of ones you don't see normally, which is a really interesting thing to conjecture. And these have been validated. Uh, often many of them are uh, inflammatory genes like TREM1 trim and so forth. Uh, and they've been validated and different. These do have consequences. And as we showed in, in that paper in 2013, uh, in the case of LPS toxicity, which you can see in the blue line there, the mice die at that sort of rate over three days, uh, that can be totally rescued by the IFNA1 uh, receptor knockout and by other interferon beta knockouts, IRF3, many groups have shown. But in the red line, you can see that there's the IFNA2 knockout can't uh, rescue at all, showing that the that non-canonical signaling of the residual IFNA1 interacting with beta, which is the interferon induced by LPS. Uh, is still having its toxic effect, showing that really this sort of non-canonical signaling has an important inflammatory lethal, in that case, consequence. Um, so it, it, it's just to, to emphasize that it's, it's signaling through if now one, not two. The issues are there's some degree of cell specificity because we don't see this in all cells. It's, it was characterized at the time in, in the mouse and we didn't know much about what, what would happen in the human. Uh, the other system where we see this same phenotype of an IFNA1 rescue, not IFNA2, was actually in the SOX1 knockout mice, which have die uh, around uh, as the end of their neonatal period at about three weeks, just up to weaning of a multi-organ inflammation, which is rescued by IFNA1, but not by IFNA2. So there seem to be a few circumstances where this non-canonical signaling can 
drive pro-inflammatory signals of some consequence. But the uh, the issue was we wondered um, whether it might only be a case of uh, in the mouse because, as you can see here, the affinity for um, if now one mouse interferon beta has very high affinity. The small numbers here in nanomolar represent the higher affinities, whereas um, uh, yeah, interferon alpha is much lower affinity to interferon alpha. But the uh, the affinities and the other interesting thing we observed that was sort of published in an obscure sort of paper is that if you see here the affinity of IFNA1 in the case of mouse beta is much higher than that of IFNA2, which is the exact opposite of mouse beta, where IFNA2, as we expect, is a high affinity interactor and um, uh, IFNA1 is the lower affinity, although it's still uh, close, uh, closer in affinity to if now one than the, than the alphas are. So for beta, I mean, I guess we, we need to really have a look at this closely and work out whether that's a concern, whether beta really in mouse models human interferon beta interactions or whether it's quite different. So the question really rose as to whether this non-canonical signaling occurred in humans. And um, to address this and, and as part of our standard routine work now, we've developed a induced pluripotent stem cell system where from iPS cells you can make macrophages and we, we've set up a nice robust protocol characterized with traditional conventional markers these responses we can show that the macrophages are active they phagocytose and they have a good robust response to LPS to interferons and a, and a range of other ligands similar to to other human macrophages of human origin the uh, phenotype of these probably resemble of all of the human macrophages tissue resident more than anything. Uh, but the great benefit of these in collaboration with John Ron Casanova's lab and people there was that um, basically we could we could obtain iPS cells from a patient with NIFNA IFNA2 deficiency and use these to look at uh, the presence of non-canonical signaling. The diagrams just show that um, we, we corrected the mutation, so we had an isogenic control cell line. And you can see here in the isogenic control, you get a good expression of cell surface, uh, if not two by flow cytometry, not in the original, if not two null. Uh, and if we challenge these with a range of interferons, they respond well. You can see on this scatter plot, genes induced and suppressed over a co wide concentration range. And this is in the, in the isogenic controls as a, a good robust response to inter human interferon beta. And in IFNA2, most of that response is gone, but there are some significant genes regulated both up and down. So this does suggest that non-canonical signaling in fact does occur in the human system. And if we <clears throat> go on and analyze these and display them a bit more, you can see certain genes here at the, this is induced genes at the six and 16 hour time point. Uh, this shows some validation of them where in the isotype controls, canonical IRGs are induced in the wild type, not at all in the, in the, in the IFNA2 knockout. Whereas some of these non-canonical genes like TREM1, which is similar to that in the mouse, it's uh, induced in blue there in the isogenic controls and in red also in the knockouts. And there are several exemplars here of this phenomenon. So this is really important. It, it really showed, told us that this non-canonical signaling can occur in human cells. And again, it's if now one dependent, if now two in, independent, and atypical signaling, you're not get the, getting the usual stat uh, ISGs uh, that you would get in, in this conventional signaling. So, so this is one way that the receptors can sort a, a different sort of response to, to the interferons. Does it matter? Well, I think it does, because if you look at the expression of receptors, and here are a few uh, examples in, in the gut and in the reproductive tract, if now one here on the left and if now two on the right, clearly have very different uh, distributions, not much in epithelial cells of if now one, uh, quite heavy expression of if now two, different in the submucosa. In a IBD patient, you can see here there are cells in the submucosa that are highly positive for IFNAR1 and negative for IFNAR2, so they would be candidates for that 
non-canonical signaling we've just described. Uh, this, this pattern that we see with IFNA 1 and 2 is not the same in all epithelia. If we look at the reproductive tract, by contrast, we get really strong epithelial staining there of IFNA 1 and IFNA 2, but again, a difference in the submucosa. So the uh, asymmetric, if you like, distribution of receptor expression is uh, very important, armed with the information that non-canonical signaling through one of them, or at least through IFNA 1, can occur. We haven't actually looked at it to see if it occurs through IFNA 2 also. Um, the other component that may have an impact is the soluble interferon receptor, and it's something that's not, uh, not, not examined much at all. We've had a, a bit of a look at this over the years. Uh, so the IFNA2 gene can either alternatively splice a soluble isoform, or it actually can be cleaved by ADAM17 to, to be released in inflamed tissues. We've been working with Tom Levar and colleagues at PBL Assay Sciences over a while who've developed a really nice and sensitive ELISA that can detect down the picograms per mil here, a few of them. Uh, it's a really nice, robust assay. And the, the amazing thing to us was that in normal human serum, culture supernatants and everything, you get really high levels, nanograms per mil of soluble if not to in healthy subject serum. And this is probably enough um, interferon sort of equimolar to hundreds to a thousand units of interferon, say, which is what you'd see in an acute viral infection. Um, excuse me, I'm a bit croaky today. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, I mean, it, it remains to be seen what this, what this protein is going to do. Soluble receptors in other systems can be carriers, they can be blockers, or they can promote signaling. Um, and so, you know, rather than drawing it, uh, it the, the situation like this one to one to one, it, it may well sort of more resemble, you know, a situation where there's a, a large amount of soluble IFNA receptor. Um, we did some work a while back and generated a mouse that expresses a soluble receptor under the under a transgene that we put in, and that, well, mice either produce two or five or tenfold higher receptor levels. And in vivo, we found no evidence of blockade, which was important and a slight increase. And whether that increase is due to pharmacokinetic properties or a trans-signaling event where the soluble binds to ligand and presents it to the other signaling chain, if now one, which would be a type of non-canonical, still remains to be seen, really. Um, so it, it appears, therefore, the point I really wanted to make from these few snap snippets of data what it appears that the selective receptor interactions with interferons can lead to different signals depending on the interferon subtype that's present. Uh, and we need to know more about the um, spatiotemporal expression of cell surface receptors, you know, I, where, where, when the protein is on the cell surface, which the data is fairly poor um, to help our understanding of what interferons are doing. So I'll come in a moment to, to, to the interferons, but it seems like with the type 1 and the type 3 interferons, there are, there are variances in the IFNA 1 and 2. Difficult to say whether it's positive or negative, but certainly excesses of one over the other, which might be enough to tip the scales to atypical and non-canonical signaling, sort of in epithelia, submucosa, and in blood. The lambda seems to be a bit more abrupt, where their main receptor is strongly expressed in in epithelial cells, not much in stroma at all, negative on a lot of blood cells, but positive in a few like PDCs. So uh, at the basal state, uh, as I'll show you, we have this unusual interferon produced in the epithelium operating. Uh, and later after a stimulus, we, uh, we have all the alphas and beta and lambda sort of produced. So yeah, depending on the state of, uh, of, of disease or situation, we can be swimming in different types of ligands here. So when when they're on with their different kinetics and where the receptors are is key to understanding how the response is happening. Um, so I'll switch now uh, for the rest of the talk from the focus on the receptors to the focus on the ligands. And as I've said, the um, the conventional type one interferons that we're used to, most people are used to thinking about the alphas and beta can probably be um, char characterized by a few main features. They are uh, 
inducible by a range of PAMPs, whether they're from pathogens or endogenous ligands that mimic them. They work through pattern recognition receptors and induce uh, through IRFs and, and a rare occasion NF-kappa B. Some of these genes, they're produced mainly by hemopoietic cells, a lot by PDCs, but many cells can produce them under different circumstances. They signal through these type 1 receptors, activate JAK stat pathways and uh, ISGs. And, you know, type 3 interferons really have pretty similar general features. What I'm going to focus on today is an interferon that Kate mentioned, uh, interferon epsilon, which is an atypical interferon in that when we discovered it about uh, many years ago now, it, it was constitutive. It was highly expressed in the reproductive tract in the endometrium shown here. Subsequently, we developed some nice reagents. You can see it's produced in the epithelial cells of all levels of the reproductive tract from the uh, uterus to the cervix to the vagina in the stratified squamous where it's made mainly in the basal cells. It's the only interferon there. If you look for type 2 and type 3 and other type 1s, you really don't see it constitutively expressed. So it, it's solo in that characteristic. The other thing is that it's hormone regulated there. Most of these studies have been done in the mice. So it varies about 50 fold in transcript levels over the course of an estrus cycle. Uh, during reproduction, it's, it's regulated again and it's switched off to almost zero production at the point of implantation. Uh, so it, its normal function would appear to need to be switched off at that time. This and more direct experiments have shown that it can be stimulated by estrogen and suppressed by, by progesterone that you can see here, which will be important. I'll come back to the progesterone level later. In humans, uh, you can see the, the levels decline by age being barely detectable in postmenopausal women and consistent with the estrogen regulation, which is in decline across those ages. There's a negative correlation, as I said, with the the progesterone receptor levels in the uterus, as we've seen from a study that we just recently published. Um, it, it's important to point out uh, in, in these clinical studies we did, funded by the Gates Foundation, actually, that this difference we see in the expression in, um, in different stages of the cycle is, is present in the endometrium, but not in the ectocervix or vagina. So even in the female reproductive tract, it's not true in every part of the organ. So it's not something we could should assume is a general phenomenon. And I think it's going to depend on where the, these hormone receptors are expressed. Uh, Protein-wise, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is related to the type 1 interferon, but it's quite distant. It's 30% similarity to alphas and, and to beta. So on sort of similarity plots, it sits out, out, out from the bunch of the typical alphas. As I mentioned before, it, its uh, affinity for the receptors is quite low and reversed in order with IFNA1 being more higher affinity slightly than, than the IFNA2. And this is really different to what you would see with the uh, other type 1 interferons. And really, I think this uh, low affinity is what you would want from a um, from a cytokine that's constitutively expressed because interferons are toxic, as we know. They can have nasty side effects. They can lead to autoimmunity and can be lethal if they're excessive signaling as was exemplified in the SOX1 case. Um, right, so it, it, it's got some very special features commensurate with its constitutive expression. It does work through IFNA1 and 2. We've shown that by this direct binding and also by signaling in knockout mouse lines. So we've showed in several studies, I'll sort of skip through a bit, that um, that it's important in vivo, even though its affinity is in vitro, the binding affinity is weak and some of the biological measurements are accordingly weaker. But it still seems to be important in protecting against uh, HSV. You can see the knockout mice get much more severe disease. Same in, in chlamydia by various measures. In vitro, we've tested HIV, which... Uh, epsilon seems to limit it, its replication. And one of the mechanisms it does by modulating a lot of the HIV restriction factors, which are interferon inducible. Um, 
So we wanted to have a look at uh, another re virus of co with consequence in the female reproductive tract, and that's the Zika virus infection. Um, and the other thing to say that these different models represent is, is they use different effector cells. So in chlamydia, NK are the, inf the effectors. In HSV, it's CD8 T cells, and T cells again in HIV. Um, in, in this, this work was recently published in PLOS Pathogens, was a collaboration with Michael Beard's lab, a colleague from Adelaide, driven largely by Rosa um, Colbeck Shackley, who you know, was a really brilliant PhD student on this one. So what, what this seems to emphasize, I think in this model in particular, why I want to run through it is the importance of the epithelial location of this cytokine and also some of the some of the way it deals with subversion by viruses of uh, RNA defenses. So this shows a number of different models uh, where we've looked at the Zika infection and shown that the knockout mice uh, are worse off than basically controls. This was done by quantitating virus. Uh, you can see here uh, in the vagina and in the uterus. In the red, there's significantly more virus, not as much as you see in the if now one knockout. So it is a contributor along with the other type one interferons. We've also shown this by um, by looking at the uh, uh, neutralizing antibody that we've got. You can see again here in the red, there's more virus if you neutralize, um, similar to the change you see with blocking interferon beta in fact so and we've also used uh, recombinant epsilon in wild type mice to show the reverse happens that you get less less virus if you inject with uh, recombinant interferon epsilon here in here in i so by three independent means there again we show that this uh, interferon epsilon is really important for protection the other thing I, I should sort of point out that in the controls here and in many of the models of infections of the reproductive tract, you actually treat with a, a progestin derivative to uh, in order for the, these models to work. And as I mentioned earlier on, that already decreases the levels of epsilon that are present by you know, four to five fold. So the control red levels are already sort of had part of their epsilon effect uh, removed. So I mean, what that means is that we're, if anything, underestimating perhaps a little bit the importance of epsilon in these situations. So we wanted to get some in vitro cell cell line systems to work. Chose a couple of lines, uh, EKT and VK2 from cervical and vaginal origins. Uh, you can see here that the virus works very, very well in these and that interferon epsilon compared, sorry, it's cut off at the bottom there, Epsilon in the green compared with uh, alpha uh, or lambda as well in this case. Uh, you can see the reduction in growth if, if you add um, the interferon epsilon in, in both situations. So just to show that these systems uh, will maintain virus growth and the epsilon is antiviral. We've looked at uh, RNA-seq to sort of look at the spread of genes and compared epsilon with, uh, which is in the pink, color you can see here with the alpha in the green and lambda in the in the orange so um, we see a good induction of genes with uh, with epsilon and lambda not as much as you see with the alphas and looking at some of the individual genes well firstly if you go over a time course you can see that there there are differences in the type 1 type 3 and the the epsilon is often uh, in between the two of them not not really has a pattern of its own. Uh, you can see here in, in some of the genes like IRF1, which is induced strongly by type by interferon alpha, uh, not so much by uh, epsilon or lambda. So in many cases, epsilon and lambda seem to show similar patterns of induction, um, which, which is commensurate with them having uh, perhaps a different, different property of protection in, in this system. The other thing we did was to look at the, the timing of, uh, of when you add the interferon epsilon and like many others, the, the earlier you add it, the better. So a pretreatment with interferon always works better than having it at the same time or post-infection post where it's 
where it's largely um, not very effective at all. So uh, again, thinking about that in the in vivo context, the constitutive interferon that's present all the time will have the advantage of having its actions there before the, the receptor. So just to put that schematically, pre-infection, we've got epsilon being constitutively driven, acting through its receptors, inducing some ISGs to provide a baseline level of, of protection before the virus comes along and induces large amounts of uh, other type one interferons. Um, but the viruses, really, there are, there are three things to consider in the viral infection. Um, one is the as the, the as well as sort of being sensed by these innate sensors like Rigaya and so forth and driving interferon production, which then signals to drive antiviral genes. The virus also produces some of these non-structural proteins which can block either at the production of interferon level or downstream of interferon. We wanted to look at if this was true of interferon epsilon and see here in Western bots with epsilon and alpha on the left and alpha on the right that these um, NS5, for example, does induce the degradation of uh, both STAT2 and STAT1, shown by the protein levels. See the same uh, decreases if you look at IRS, ISRE activity of a reporter or look at particular interferon sensitive genes. So epsilon does seem to be susceptible to the same blockade post receptor interaction. And this is shown really nicely here in this immunofluorescence. And if we really summarize over here in the right, the red is um, a viral E protein. So you can see the cytoplasmic staining of cells infected with virus. Green is uh, STAT1 in that case, STAT2 down here. Uh, when it's inactive, it stays cytoplasmic. Once it's activated, it goes nuclear. So interesting thing you can see is these cells that are positive for virus, the Interfere, the stat is sequestered in the cytoplasm and doesn't go to the nucleus because of those non-structural proteins. So a really nice demonstration there. In other cells where the viral protein is not expressed, they're deactivated ones where you can see in the neighboring cells the nuclear localization. Um, so therefore, while, while epsilon is constitutively expressed in, in the cells that are expressing the virus, there is this blockade. You can see there in the red lines of the intracellular post-receptor signaling by epsilon. What about upstream? Um, well, Rosa actually set up this really nice experiment to look at um, whether epsilon production was affected by these non-structural proteins. So basically she set up reporters, um, but there's um, going from left to right here, mock infected, empty reflector with a constitutively active rig eye uh, co-expressed co with NS1 protein, NS2, NS4, and NS5. So you can see here with interferon beta, there's an induction of, of the reporter and an inhibition by three of these non-structural proteins, not by that one. With lambda, the same, the induction is reduced. There's a logs phase over here. So the percent of inhibition is very significant, 90% essentially. Um, and you can see that for three of the proteins and not the NS2. But the really interesting thing here was in the case of interferon epsilon, there was absolutely no inhibition um, by those sort of factors, which really sort of points to one of the strengths. And that's consistent with this protein having, or the gene having a really different promoter, not being driven by the pattern recognition receptor pathways for in, by according to any evidence we could look at and find anyway. Excuse me. Um, right. So basically what that means is that the, the virus, while it shuts down the production and the action of type 1 interferons, as you can see here in the infected cell, it won't affect the production of interferon epsilon. And while this won't be able to signal to the cell where the virus is made, in the neighboring cell where you can see in these fluorescence, the virus isn't expressed and interferons are activated, epsilon will be able to act. So a real advantage for a constitutive protein with different rules and regulations not to be inhibited by these proteins that would block um, the uh, conventional type one interferons, which I think is a really neat finding. 
Um, so as I said, um, basically having added sort of Zika now to our armory in, of uh, models where Epsilon certainly has a, a strong in vivo protective role uh, and as shown by Zika infection, important that it's may expressed in the uh, and can act on the epithelial cells that are a case of infection, but it also has the ability to muster these immune cells, whether they be CD8 T cells or NK cells uh, to, to come and aid in the protection. Um, so this actually was reminiscent a, a little bit of a situation with, with tumors where there's also a battle of um, activation and evasion of immune uh, protective effects. And certainly some of these culprits of NK cells and CD8 T cells uh, are players there. So we decided to have a look in that situation, knowing full well, as we'd reviewed some years ago, that um, interferon has, or type one interferons in general have a, a long history of anti-tumor activity. They can either act directly on tumor cells as summarized here to um, regulate proliferation apoptosis, a lot of anti-tumor uh, activities, but they can also activate almost every effector arm of the immune response uh, into anti-tumor activities. Uh, but really none of this had been known for inter uh, interferon epsilon. The one thing that's really limited the uh, use of type one interferons has been the pharmacology. It's sort of dose limiting toxicity has been a bit prohibited. Um, so we wanted to model this high grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most commonest form of ovarian cancer. It's five year survival rate is only 50% and hasn't changed much in the last 40 years because women tend to present late with extensive peritoneal metastases uh, they often are resistant to start with or develop resistance to chemotherapy. And there's a real need to understand these tumours better so we can develop more treatments. These tumours actually arise not from the ovary, but from the distal epithelia of the fallopian tube. So we first wanted to see if epsilon was going to be a, an intrinsic regulator, whether it was expressed there. And you can see here it was in humans and in mouse in the oviduct as well, where it's expressed in the epithelium. Again, compared to other interferons, it's the only one that's there constitutively. And when we look at tumors uh, in, in different studies, either at the protein level, the mRNA level, which is spread here across a log scale, the, the small number of controls there decreased to almost zero in many of the cases. And in a larger cohort of a Singapore study, analyzing public data sets. Again, there was a dramatic decrease in the transcript level. So both at the transcript and protein levels, this uh, interferon epsilon seems to be decreased by the time you get to tumors. Um, we also, I'll, I'll describe in a minute, the a mouse model that we've done considerable study on. It's interesting to note, which I won't go into much more than this, to, but just to say that the knockout mice, mice develop more tumors. So all of this is, is sort of circumstantial and pretty strong evidence that epsilon is indeed a tumor suppressor in the, this mouse model of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And we wanted to, to go along and demonstrate this a bit, a bit more directly. So the model we use is, is this ID8 cell line where you can inoculate at different, different times and different stages. And we either treat with interferon from the time of inoculation or later, once the tumor's developed. You inject the, the tumors into the bursary, burst around the outside of the ovary, so it grows as this quasi-primary. The mice develop a malignant ascites, you can, you can see here. Um, hemorrhagic ascites is much like the human case and, and the peritoneal cavity has you know, lots and lots of these tumors which we sort of score manually. So in this system, we take the peritoneal fluid for immunophenotyping to look at what sort of the immune reaction is and quantitate the tumors by various different sort of parameters here. <clears throat> so the first thing to say is whether it's sort of on, a, whether we're looking at an established, developing tumor or an already established one, the epsilon has a dramatic defect effect in reducing the number of tumors. You can see a, an extreme example here, much more effective than beta, which is really interesting, shown there macroscopically. Um, 
So it certainly does decrease tumor burden. It's interestingly more potent than beta and in, is active in different sort of treatment scenarios, which is really promising. The other thing on looking at immune responses, we can see uh, the, the overall numbers tend to mim mimic the and follow the, the number of tumor cells as a reaction to that. But when you look at this particular subtypes, we see activation of, um, of immune cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells and NK cells shown here. We get a loss of suppressor cells, even though is, there is a decrease of at max 50% in total cell numbers myeloid-derived suppressor cells are basically all wiped out in this situation. If we look at the functionality of the tumor cells exposed in vivo, immune cells exposed in vivo to the tumors then taken out and tested in vitro, you can see increased killing uh, activity induced by epsilon and consistent with markers of Grand's thyme and so forth, which uh, mark an increased capacity to kill tumor cells. So we seem to be getting a good effect on the immune response and it's uh, impacting on the tumors. Um, we did another version of this model from uh, Ian McNeish in London, who had knocked out a couple of tumor suppressor genes, which to mimic the human situation better. And again, showed on this sort of multi-parameter uh, anti-tumor effect here that there's a growing anti-tumor effect over a dose responsive range in this cumulative score. And again, at the highest dose, whether we're looking at individual cells, ascites, volume, mesentery scores, at the highest dose, you're virtually wiped out, as you can see here, the tumors, which is quite amazing. Um, to look at the mechanism, we, we looked uh, essentially at the, um, you did this model in knockout mice and in the IFNA knockout mice, um, as you can see here, there's a reduced activity, but there is still some activity. So the inference from this is that, let me get through the animations, that there is both a, a direct and an indirect effect because um, there is a change from wild type to the knockout, but the knockout still has some activity. So it looks like some of the anti-tumor activity, at least from this study, is via direct action on the tumor cells and some via the immune cells. Um, and so we looked in vitro at whether this, uh, tum these tumor cells were responding and indeed you can induce apoptosis by various measures by using interferon epsilon. Again, by different means you can show in green here, there's a reduced proliferation as we see with other type one interferons and the genes induced are, cell cycle and those involved in apoptosis commensurate with these biological effects we see. So there's no doubt that the, the epsilon does have a capacity to, to impact on the, um, directly on the tumor growth. To complete this, we, uh, we generated, and this work's done by Nicole Campbell in the lab, um, receptor knockout tumor cells here. This just shows they are generated by CRISPR. They don't induce any genes and they don't have any anti-proliferative activity. So when we run the model on them, we, we were expected to see a more biased effect, but basically the effect is equal, if not more to what we see in the wild type mice, which basically in these mice, there can be no direct effect of the mice on the tumor cells, only on immune cells. So this would say in at least this version that you can get a complete uh, effect, almost all the effect is happening via the immune cells. Uh, and again, this is shown individually here for the different, different parameters. And if we look at the immune system here, again, you get increased killing of tumor cells, as I've showed before. You get activation of um, CD8 T cells in the wild type and in the knockouts. Um, you get um, stimulation of proliferation of immune cells. Uh, activation of PD-1 positive T regs, and again, removal of the myeloid derived suppressor cells. So the treatment, you know, summarized here, and I'm whipping through it, I apologize, is that there is a reduction in the immunosuppression, aggressive immune cells and an activation of the anti-tumor immune cells. So what seems to be happening here is that Epsilon 
uh, in, in this particular last experiment can act only directly on the tumor cells and they in turn uh, have a response uh, of, on, on these, um, on the tumor cells from the immune cell, activated immune cells, and that, that is measured as a full response. In a situation where these, these are, these are um, knockout, then basically epsilon can impact on the uh, tumor cells and there's a partial response. But when you have a non-responsive tumor and an interferon responsive stroma, um, you can get a full response um, with, without this sort of direct effect of epsilon on the tumor just via secondary factors, which can't be interferons because this is these tumors are insensitive to interferons. So interferons activating these immune cells to produce some secondary factors or secondary um, mechanisms that act in an interferon independent way on tumor inhibition. So to, um, to summarize here then the uh, tumor effects uh, and to, um, to wrap up a bit, it's um, what this latter work shows is interferon is a unique cytokine fit for purpose to regulate reproductive tract mucosal immunity. Uh, we've shown it in, you know, we have other data that, that I didn't have time to show here, which includes um, the use of um, PDX from the individual patients and so forth. The mechanism seems to be by activating largely anti-tumor immune responses with some direct action on tumor cells, but potentially being able to um, modulate their proliferation and apoptosis, but largely producing secondary factors that again regulate indirectly the immune response. And the fact that epsilon is a lower affinity um, and constitutive by design, we think may be better tolerated as a, as a, if, if it's um, injected IV or uh, parenterally uh, and a lower toxicity because it's there anyway. And so we, we think that the therapeutic potential of this molecule in these cancers might be, might be significant and we're working towards that. Um, so to summarize, in general, then, um, interferon is a, is a constitutive. So this is really different to the conventional type one interferons we're used to. It's constitutive. It's an epithelial cytokine with distinct features uh, that control when and where it's produced, uh, which has particular benefits, uh, both physiologically. So, for example, hormone regulation can switch it off at the time of implantation in pregnancy. In viruses, it's not not in its production is not inhibited by some of the viral blockers, and it also uh, has the strength and duration and nature of signaling can be controlled differently through the receptors. In other words, what it does is unique as well. Its constant presence in the front line of mucosal sites is clearly effective from the in vivo studies we've shown at protecting from infections and tumorigenesis. So it seems to have a general protective role there on mucosal immunity. And just a, qu a quick aside in, in looking, which I haven't had time to show at what's regulating interferon uh, epsilon, it is this transcription factor L3. But I just wanted to point out, we'd worked on this before and gotten in different places, but it led us to, to sort of look in other places and certainly epsilon can be seen um, in the ep gut epithelium, in both small and large intestine of mouse and humans and in some of the bronchiolar epithelium in the lungs. So I think the general features that we've um, discussed and, and looked at here today may well apply in other mucosal sites as well and will be well worth sort of looking at. Um, so I'd like to thank you for the attention and the opportunity to present the work of this wonderful gang of people. I'd um, listed down here on the left the people mostly present and some past members of our lab I'd like to highlight uh, for the tumour work in the end, Nicole Campbell, Zoe Marks and Nolik Burke were big drivers of that, which we expect to be published soon. In blue there, Nikki, San, Tony do a lot of the protein structure function work with his underpins a lot of this work. Jamie, the uh, bioinformatics and gene regulation analysis. Uh, and Hani there in green has set up the... Um, IPS cells, which you know, holds a lot of promise for studying different models. Uh, outside our institute, we've had great collaborations with uh, Phil Hanver and his colleagues at different locations uh, and the chlamydia and now in some of the lung models. As I mentioned, the, the work on Zika was uh, a collaboration with Michael Baird's lab and Rosa uh, 
was essentially her PhD. And the tune work also has had a big boost from a collaboration with Claire Scott, Cass and Matt at, uh, at We High in Melbourne. I'd like to also fund, uh, thank uh, Tom Lavar and people at PBL who've helped us develop some assays. We've co-developed a couple of things that'll be very useful for our studies and, and thank our funders as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very That's much, great. Paul. Yeah, that was wonderful. If you could stop sharing your screen for one second, and I'll just remind everyone how yeah. to do questions. That was a, a tour de force. It's wonderful. All right, let me just quickly do this. Um, out of the way. Can you see that, Paul? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. So just to remind everyone, so we do Q&A through Twitter. So you can um, search for the account Global Immunotox, find a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Paul Herzog here, and then reply to that tweet with your questions. And you can mention uh, Global Immuno. And then Paul's is at PH Paul JH um, for questions. So I think, yeah, I think that is it. Thank you very much.